Freeze um, when he is very much a part of um, this artistic flourishing across the United States. Um, you'll note that the, the major show on the Harlem Renaissance opens at the Metropolitan Museum next week, and so it's really nice for these kind of companion shows on both coasts that uh, have drawn greater focus into this, this era. Um, and in the, from this first room, we get a real sense of the variety of artistic materials it's working with. So we have um, hand-hammered copper masks uh, to your left, uh, five of them both from institutional and private collections. We have works in terracotta in the wall cases. We have lithographs on the walls, also a chalk drawing. And then I want to draw your attention to the, uh, the two sculptures uh, freestanding in the center, both borrowed from SF MoMA's collection, both acquired by the museum at a pretty early date. This is called Forever Free from 1933, and that's Negro Woman from, I think, 1936 or the mid-1930s. They're made in a very unusual material. Um, he starts with a, a kind of solid block of redwood as the core of the sculpture, and then he wraps it in a, like a linen gauze, like almost like a bandage around it. Then he covers that with plaster, at some areas where you see the whites, it's probably pure plaster. And then other areas, he paints the outside surface and then later varnishes. And you'll also notice, if you look closely, that he's incised the surface of the plaster to give like subtle definition. Very subtly apparent here as well, as if the woman's hands are folded. Yeah, very beautiful sculpture. So this is a technique that in, you know, in kind of his moment, um, co commenters talk about as being Egyptian. He's looking back at um, this, you know, this technique that had been used for a long time in, in Egypt, but also in the Italian Renaissance, and you see it in European traditions, and Sergeant Johnson was a professional frame maker as well, and probably like worked with and experimented with this technique uh, in his frame making uh, studio. So it's just really interesting. Um, these kind of sculptures are so unusual for the time period. And he's, I think one thing that's really important about these two is that as a modernist sculptor, for me, from one thing, I, I, this is my kind of guess, but as a modernist sculptor interested in polychrome sculpture, you know, he's working with artists who believe that the proper way to make a sculpture is just to like, carve out of a, out of a piece of stone. The harder the stone, the, the better, um, the tougher the work, the better the piece is. But he's trying to come up with a way to make polychrome sculpture. And so uh, basically invents a sculptural medium to make these works that allows him to make because of that really complicated, time-consuming, labor-intensive process of adding all these layers to the piece. Uh, it, I think that makes the color integral to the medium itself, integral to the materials he's carving with. And for him, that can make the work have a certain modernist integrity. So he's not just carving something of wood and then painting it with a brush. That the color is actually you know, something he has to carve into to define details like the hands or even some of the finer details of the eyes and things like that. Um, I and think I, that's important. Yeah, and I've got to, I mean, if we look um, behind you there at the drawing, it's like many modernists, both in North America, in the Americas and in Western Europe, is that they're learning from sculpture. So even when they're working on um, two-dimensional kinds of works, drawings, paintings, etc., you can see that sculpture, and especially sculpture from the non-Western world is an important inspiration. So he's not only making sculpture, but he's learning from sculpture. And those of you who follow careers like Picasso or Rivera um, will see that kind of tradition in terms of not sculpture, in terms of academic sculpture being the only thing that they look at, but they're also looking at ritual sculpture from across the globe. And so that work there, you know, which is sometimes we talk about as a sort of totem, um, and we're not sure about that title and how appropriate it is, does resonate with the idea of the indigenous totem, which is, of course, very apparent up and down the Pacific coast. Yeah, and it's interesting. 